how to use these controls. Not everyone is on America Online Time Warner. They, uh, uh, there are at least 63 million families online, and AOL Time Warner has not yet got all of them. Um, uh, and they may, uh, uh, but it, but the the real the, so the real issue is why why can't we uh, confront the educational issue? Why can't we get uh, the the uh, the disc that AOL Time Warner would get thirty a month and used to get them uh, in the mail uh, from AOL Time Warner saying plug this into your computer? Such a thing sent out by the government, uh, which gives a real tutorial on on how to use online services and how to protect kids and what are the dangers out there. It's not a it's not a a, a budget busting uh, kind of Solution. And I'm not saying that's the only one, but there's been no no center of gravity, no thinking, no coherent uh, approach uh, to to make uh, bring up adult literacy uh, about what their options are. Yeah, just briefly, uh, without getting into the legislation and the and the legal challenges. I think there are a number of things you need to look at. Number one, you have to look at how much of a problem it really is. And I've talked to teachers and, and librarians, and while some are concerned, uh, fewer than you might expect uh, are terribly concerned about the issue of uh, inappropriate material. Uh, there are other ways to control child behavior besides filters. Uh, the most useful, I think, is adult supervision. Uh, the other is to, to realize, again, why children look at pornography and where they look at pornography. And I suspect that that problem is more in the home uh, than in a public uh, open library school. Uh, the other question, and David addressed this issue earlier, is the biggest concern that I have is the false sense of security. That the biggest danger, it gets back to what we talked about earlier, earlier, is not so much what you see, but what you say. And while, again, schools and libraries have a responsibility to protect children against inappropriate material, they have a responsibility to protect their safety. And this doesn't deal with that issue. And so. It would be tragic if a teacher or a librarian were to let his or her guard down, thinking, oh, it's okay, these machines have filters, and then have some crime committed against the child, which might have been prevented if that teacher or librarian were more on top of uh, supervising behavior. So we really need to watch it. And then finally, in many ways, putting filters on computers are a little bit like putting metal detectors in, on the, in the school. The metal detector may prevent a, a crime from being committed within the school grounds, but it won't prevent somebody from standing outside the metal detector and committing a crime. So again, there are many, many areas where children can get access to the internet. Schools are one of them, and this is not really going to have, I think, a, a wholesale uh, effect on child safety on the internet. Okay, other questions? We have a question here. You just introduce yourself. At Lisa Kessler of Leslie Harrison Associates, I just wanted to mention another resource. The Consortium on School Networking is putting together a resource for compliance with the Children's Internet Protection Act um, for school members. And there will be a lot of uh, interactive materials. That will probably be available by the end of this month. Right there. Hi, uh, Kelly Goldcock, Virgin News. Um, this question for um, Mr. Brandlock. Um, out of the 1,500 or so cases, that were open last year. Do you have any breakdown as to how many of those were child porn related or as opposed to uh, children that had been like, lured out of the home and uh, predatory measures? And also, in terms of your um, online investigation, um, can, I, you mentioned um, tracking chat lines and going up on tips. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your the whole active measure that we're about in terms of Agents um, uh, going undercover um, and posing as you know young children or young teens, and, and, and actually going after certain people that they found in these chat rooms, and also uh, whether or not you track people's online activities once they've gone into a site that might be questionable. Okay, to answer your first part of your question, you may have to repeat the last part, but we'll get there. Uh, out of 1,500 cases we worked last year, we would estimate somewhere in the region of a thousand cases what we would call travelers or enticers, the lures. So it's maybe 80% that were actually, they're the ones that get the highest priority from us in terms of what puts the children most at risk and the most immediate danger. They're the ones we give it the top priority. 
So you're seeing, you know, maybe 80% 80, 80 of them are them. The rest are, are traders, tra uh, possessors of child pornography. In terms of the second part was uh, what proactive measures undercover work. I don't know if you're asking me uh, how we go in undercover or uh, we won't get into what we do or how we say it, but many of the avenues we go into are based on the tips that we receive and parents, whether it's where, whatever venue, it's from the ISP saying, hey, we identified this site and we go in, obviously we can't go in into that site because they can trace to where it's coming from and it does not say FBI.gov. So uh, many of our sites are, are, as we call them, covert sites that we are acting in. We'll go in to see if it's a legitimate complaint and then go in there and believe me, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of predicated chat rooms where obvious titles of the chat rooms are very indicative that child pornography or um, some of the latest things we're seeing is groups or websites or web circles per se, we call them e-circles, where you have to be an invited guest into these e-circles and once you're invited in, it's a host of one we're focusing on has 4,000 members and all of them trade child pornography amongst themselves. And obviously, we then have invited maybe one of the members and we were then invited in and now we're a member. So we go into these websites or these chat rooms per se and our group, our focus now is can we really with the resources we have arrest 4,000 people at once? We can't. We, we can't even burn in the court system. But we're going to go in and with the cooperation of the ISPs who can do a wonderful job for us once we give them advance notice, uh, what we call preservation letters saying, hey, we're looking at these different individuals, please preserve all the logs and chats and we can tell where the child pornography came and went from. And we're going to have some big impacts here in the near future where we have successfully infiltrated these inner circles. And uh, these are mostly your travelers, your traders. But the bottom, I mean, your your traders and your, and your producers. But remember, at the on the other side of all them pictures is, is a true victim somewhere, a true child victim. Yeah. Let me tr sh take a shot at it, and then I'm sure uh, uh, Don, Don, you want to take a shot at it first? I mean, you, you know the technology, and you know what ICANN looks like. Let me, let me, let me just, first of all, um, notwithstanding ICANN challenges, I mean, they have a very significant global political problem that they're struggling with, so let's put that issue aside. Now, I think the sense of the commission is we look very hard at these as possible if you will, magic bullets, okay? But when you really start to peel back the issue, when you look at the uh, difficulty and actually, for example, take the green space question, say a dot kids, how do you actually guarantee the quality of the material in there or the filtering? And what standard do you use, okay? This is a global medium that we're talking about. So do you use the standard in Stockholm or the standard in Boise, Idaho? Okay, they're probably not the same, okay? And so that really became a challenge to us. And how do you, how do you guarantee and what is the liability issue, okay? If you advertise this as a clearly safe medium and kids are protected. Another issue that came up is have you just created an incredibly rich, dense zone for predators, okay? I mean, you now have a place where they know good kids are gonna be and they're gonna all feel safe and their parents are gonna think they're safe, and so, wow, this is terrific, okay? This is like Christmas, okay, to creditors. And so, when we started examining the issues in the debate with, among the commission, that one just seemed to be so problematic that it fell aside. 
Okay, the other one, the dot .xx domain, there's a lot of interest in that from the terms of it. But the question is, do you just create another avenue for people to, to advertise pornographic websites? Or do you, in fact, create a mandatory zone for people to go in? If it's mandatory, you run right back into the First Amendment issues you have for non-obscene material. There is adult material on the web that is legally protected, okay, that it exists now in, say, .com or other subdomains. And creating a .xx, if you don't mandate that people go there, okay, you run into a problem. Now, you could consider uh, inducing people to go there, okay? But quite frankly, a lot of people who are fairly conservative on this issue don't want to reward people for taking their, as they would call it, their smut into a separate domain. So the issue has political overtones, technical overtones, and it sounds great on um, first blush, but when you really start to dig into it, the implementation and the political issues of this company, we felt were too difficult to deal with at this time. And it is my personal opinion that that is exactly the reason that the ICANN staff ducked that issue on the first go around. The last thing they needed, the first time they implemented new top-level domains, was to implement any that were controversial any that were politically problematic, or any that couldn't be reconciled alone. If you look at what they implemented, I think that they were the mom and apple pie of TLDs. My, my, one last point on that. Uh, I would argue that, that if ICANN got into that, they would be uh, stretching their jurisdiction in ways that would, that would uh, be harmful to ICANN's more tactical and narrow mission. But in that, the, the, the in dealing with the members of the European Parliament who are wrestling with this issue and with the Bertelsen Foundation, which has been trying to promote rating and labeling in, in Europe, there is no coherent standard uh, about who, what goes into the X box. Uh, there are great differences between countries. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of the content that we, that we have, uh, which is wild in this country, Europeans would want in the Xbox. Um, and there's a lot of content that we want to put in the Xbox that they want to put, uh, they, they wouldn't care about uh, zoning off. So there's difficulties in, 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 in there's, no, there's no common culture, uh, and the internet is global. You know, I promised I would end on time. Tim, uh, we have time for, okay, I got permission. Go ahead, Matt. I gave you wire from these bikes. Um, has to support 
efforts um, by this administration to uh, aggressively pursue the broad spectrum of criminal activity here, not just a narrow section of it, because when it focuses on a very narrow area, it's what it goes back to that marshmallow analogy I was using before. Uh, <coughs> before. The, you, know, you end up pushing real hard in one area, but as the tide and everything gets worse all around, you end up with a situation where there's more of even the worst kind of problem. And that does not bode well for individual children. I mean, that's what you know, we cannot lose sight of the fact that these are real children that are being abused, exploited, introduced to material at, at, at inappropriate ages. That's what we have to focus on. I think that, that aggressive enforcement of existing law is what we would like to see uh, Congress support. And, and that is uh, an appropriation is legislation. Um, and an appropriation, and if someone wanted to do authorizing legislation for an educational program uh, that would run through the schools, through local communities, um, I think the commission's recommendations would support that legislation. Uh, there are things what, where we did not think we had a consensus is how to, how to design a, a, a criminal statute that would uh, deal with this gray area material in a way that didn't um, uh, lock us up in the same constitutional issues that that, uh, that, that the courts are have faced are facing again. In, in, in trying to put a historical perspective on this, I think it's important that we look at it. If we look back at the last five years, the CDA and the COPA and now the CHIPA bill, okay, we ask ourselves, what was what was right about those, what was wrong about those? In my opinion, what was wrong about those is that they weren't really well thought out pieces of legislation. That is, they were legislation which assumed that this problem is solvable by a very narrow magic bullet approach. And I am here to tell you, okay, after having been in this debate now for a year and deeply involved, having listened to witness after witness, that isn't going to happen. If all the energy and all the resources that were devoted towards preparing those bills passing those bills, litigating those bills, okay, up to the Supreme Court, we're devoted towards implementing the recommendations that are in this report, we'd be a lot further down the road. And so the message to take to your bosses is, this is a complicated issue, and it requires a nuanced solution. Okay, that, in my mind, is probably the single most important thing that we as commissioners got out of this, which is why I think we didn't try to recommend notwithstanding that Congress creates laws because that's its job, okay, we didn't kind of recommend that you take another shot at another magic bullet, okay, as a commission as well. Now, there were members of the commission, and do, and do respect for the commission, there were members of the commission that felt that legislation was important, but the commission has a tot totality, even though I didn't mandate uniform, a, a, you know, a, a homogeneous agreement on everything, the commission couldn't come with a recommendation that was majority supported and recommended any mandatory light filtering additional legislation. Okay, last question. Oh my goodness. Um, let, me, let me try and get to a quick one, one answer. Yeah, okay. I, I okay. push everybody over time. Don needs to start. Um, everybody up there has said we need more law enforcement resources. How much more? Do we need another 100 agents at the FBI? Do we need 1,000? you know, law enforcement officers throughout the country working on this. What, what kind of picture are we looking at? <laughs> we need a thousand. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, we, we originally appropriated $10 million, and we get it every year. That funds about 35 agents, 29 support people. We use additional $6.5 million of $10 million goes towards just salaries, benefits, etc. The rest goes towards our enforcement side. What's the magic number? Uh, I don't know. We're looking at it. But it's you, orders of magnitude. It's not incremental. Is that right? Correct. Correct. I mean, we, we basically haven't received any additional resources since we had the appropriate money in 98. And we've asked every year since then for additional resources to focus on this issue. And it's fell on deaf ears. Um, that's being very candid with you. Let's move on to our last question. Sexual predators are usually uh, 